There's really no debate about whether we need more rental housing. It's part of the Ontario government's rationale for all the changes brought in under Bill 23 late last year. But one thing that once provided a big boost in housing isn't on the table. For the government itself to step forward and build the rental housing that's needed. Should they? Let's get into that with Brad Bradford. He's city councillor for Toronto Ward 19, Beaches East York, and chair of the Planning and Housing Committee. Tony Irwin, president and CEO of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. And Carolyn Weitzman, housing researcher and adjunct geography professor at the University of Ottawa, who's traveled all the way from the nation's capital to be with us in the provincial capital. So thank you for making the long schlep, and thank you, you two, for coming much closer distances, but we're happy to have you anyway. Let's do a little Housing History 101 here, shall we? Okay, when did governments first start building homes in this country? 1940s is a good place to start. So during the Second World War, uh, there was a huge housing shortage. 20% of um, households were doubling up in Toronto. Uh, and there was a commission called the Curtis Commission that looked at long-term issues for after World War II. They recommended that a third of new construction be government-built public housing. What kind of public housing? Uh, public housing for returning heroes, Steve. Yeah. So public housing for young men who were returning from the war, who wanted to have families, and who would be considered starting level working people, uh, earning the equivalent of minimum wage. So this is apartment buildings or homes or what? Well, both. Everything. So uh, there was a great deal of land that was bought up by the federal government. They worked in partnership with local authorities in order to speed up uh, the construction of housing. There were about a million homes built between 1945 and 1960 under that scheme. In the whole country? In the whole country. Okay. Unfortunately, a lot of them were sold. So a um, house in Don Mills, to give one example, that sold for the second time in 1951 for $4,500, sold in uh, 2021 for um, a million three. <laughs> so that tells you a lot. It tells you a lot about one of the errors, which was once you sell the house, you can no longer control the price. So um, that was perhaps a bit of an error. A lot of the houses were built for rental and then sold off. And have we had any governments, federal, provincial, municipal, or otherwise, since World War II who were as seized with the idea of building housing as we had back then? Do I get a prize for winning, uh, mentioning Bill Davis? Absolutely. I thought In the so. Bill Davis studio, you do. <laughs> I thought so, yeah. Um, so for a long time, uh, governments, both federal and provincial, did a lot more than they do today around uh, both social housing and private rental. So if you're looking at the uh, 70s or the 80s, 10% of all construction was nonprofit housing, and that was both the federal government and provincial governments, particularly the Ontario government. So the current Prime Minister's father and Bill Davis. Two very uh, helpful people. On the housing file. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Let's, uh, Sheldon, can we bring this graphic up now? Top of page two, Ontario rental housing starts. Let's just look at the last 30 plus years, shall we? Uh, got a lot done. Rental construction starts, got a lot done in the early 1990s. For those of you listening on podcast, we'll just say that uh, it was going gangbusters in the early 1990s. Then the recession hit, and this number, the graph, just takes, it's like a ski slope. It just goes straight down. It sort of inches its way back up through the early part of the 21st century. And as we get to the year 2021, the ski slope is actually starting to come back up. So I guess we need to ask here, Carolyn, what happened in the early 1990s that sent the number down, and what's bringing it back up? Well, I think it was the worst of all possible worlds, and I think Tony will have a certain amount to say about this when he gets his turn. So partly it was a recession, partly it was construction uh, costs and interest costs going up, partly it was a change in government regulations to um, support home ownership at the expense of rental housing construction, and part of it was simply that... Um, uh, condos had come along, they'd come along in the 70s, they'd become legalized, but they suddenly became a much better um, penciling out factor than rental construction. 
So it was sort What's of a, a penciling it, out factor mean. Well, I mean, it was just um, better for developers in terms of profit uh, to get a profit through selling uh, condos as opposed to retaining and renting out uh, apartments. Okay. So it, the thing about housing policy that we need to start with is there is no magic bullet. It's always a confluence of factors that need to be looked at and all three levels of government. I think she said Tony may have something to say about this because you worked for the Mike Harris government at the time. And if you look at the late 1990s, the numbers are pretty low. They are. How come? Yeah, I, I think obviously mo most of the main points, or virtually all of the main points, were hit uh, by Carolyn. And so uh, I guess I would just expand uh, on, uh, certainly was, as with respect to condominiums, it's true that the economics of condominiums are different than rental. Uh, obviously, they have to pencil out. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, that became uh, something that was much more uh, economically feasible uh, to be able to get the, the capital into building those kinds of uh, projects. That said, you know, we fast forward in, in the, inter the periods after that, and we know the rental was not getting built uh, at the extent that we needed to, uh, sh except for the last couple of years, we did start to see, uh, I think the chart showed, the numbers starting to, to trend in the right direction again, but nowhere near what we need. And so the conversation really needs to be about how much housing do we need, what kind of housing do we need, and who needs to play what role in supporting and make that happen. All good questions we're going to get to. Brad, let me bring you in on this sort of... Uh deeply philosophical question here, which is to say the numbers have been fairly low for about the last 20 years or so, inching up lately, as we've said. Does this reflect in your view, if, and I ask you, this is a former planner, you used to work in the planning department at the city before you got elected, does this reflect a failure of the market to deal, to, to create enough housing that we need in cities and towns all over the province? Well, it is a complicated issue, and, and I think there's a lot of dynamics at play. First and foremost, policy at the federal and provincial uh, levels that you know have incentivized the construction of rental uh, those disappeared and we just saw that on the graph and that really changed the investment profile uh, and the decisions for people to park their their time and their energy and their capital into these projects so we moved away from rental there's been a lot of challenges at local government we have to have some humility around that um, our involvement in whether we are helping to facilitate the construction of new new housing uh, whether that's rental or condominium uh, we certainly you know historically have been obstructionists in that there's a very very strong NIMBY culture here in Toronto post amalgamation. That's changing. I think we're at a tipping point because we're recognizing the breadth of the crisis that we're dealing with. And, um, you know, on a, on a go forward basis, the city of Toronto will continue to be a magnet for, for talent, for immigration, for folks who want to come here. And if you want to come and live in the city of Toronto, I want you to live here. But first and foremost, we need to make sure that there's an opportunity for folks to have an affordable option to live. And right now, with respect to rental, we're dealing with less than 1% rental vacancy in the Toronto market. And so rents, supply and demand, rents are going up. Uh, availability is going down. We're facing headwinds with rising interest rates. So folks who perhaps were looking to get into home ownership are not necessarily able to do that right now because of the cost of capital and financing challenges. And so all of that makes it, you know, much more stress and strain on the rental market in Toronto, and, and we don't have enough. This I, I got numbers to prove, actually, what you just said. Sheldon, with me here, top of page three. Rent increases in Ontario municipalities over last year to this year. Actually, this is two years ago. December 2021 to December 2022. And, I mean, we know we live in a world where inflation is worse now than it's been in 40 years. But really, Toronto... Year-over-year year, rental increases up almost 21%. City of Vaughan, almost 30%. London, Ontario, more than 30%. Brampton, Ontario, more than 30%. Uh, all these numbers courtesy of rentals.ca, which is, a, um, I think, a relatively well-known website for rental listings for um, what's going on out there. Um, okay, let's go back at it again. Sure. We live in a world of 6 7% inflation. These numbers are 3 four times that. How come? They are. So I think the first thing for perspective, uh, Steve, is that of course the majority of uh, tenants in the province are rent controlled, live in rent controlled units. So their rents only go up by the amount that the province uh, authorizes each year, as we well know. And I think this year it's 2.5%. Uh, Last year it was 1.2%. The year before that was zero. So those are very different numbers than the ones you just had on the screen. That's not to take away from that. So getting to, to why those are numbers are where they are, uh, of course, that does uh, speak to uh, newer construction uh, built after 2018. 
I'm not going to suggest that those numbers aren't big. They are big, and I think that would imp have impacts on people uh, in managing their household budgets. That's certainly something that, that I would acknowledge. Uh, but certainly, I think it, it does speak to the fact, though, uh, that we do need a lot more supply. And I certainly, while I'm not an economist, uh, believe that you know supply and demand, I do believe in that uh, fundamental principle. We need more supply, and that will inevitably help uh, with the cost of rent. It won't solve the problem, uh, clearly, but I think it will do, go a long way to helping that. So we do need to get more housing built to try to relieve some of that pressure. You want to jump in on that? Absolutely. We absolutely need more supply. I would be the last person to argue with that. There's a whole bunch of adjacent markets that are crowding in on rental right now. Home ownership has become virtually impossible for an entire generation of young people. So they're in the rental market. Uh, older people are living longer in their homes, which is a good thing. They're still in the rental uh, market. Students are in the um, rental market. They aren't even counted in core housing need. And there isn't enough social housing being built so very poor people are doing whatever they can to get into the private rental market. However, even keeping that in mind, when was there the big dip in rental construction? It was at the same time that Mike Harris got in and got rid of vacancy control and started um, uh, eating away at rent control. So rent control is not the major factor. What's, in just explain what that means. The, the, rent control? No, the vacancy control. Oh, vacancy control. Yeah. So let me give an example from my personal life. I have a son who's 30, he's married. He lives in a one bedroom apartment in downtown Ottawa with a wife and a dog. Um, they'd love to move. They pay $1,200 uh, um, uh, dollars a month rent. Uh, they can't move because there's no way that they could move next door to a two bedroom apartment without paying 2,200 because the moment that they move, the rent is going to jump to whatever the market allows, which could be 22, 2,500. They can't afford to buy a house. Their choice is to move way out of the city or not have children. And that is a choice facing so many millennials these days, and it, and it needs to be addressed. Can I follow with you on that, Brad? Do, do you hear from constituents, we'd actually love to have kids, but we can't afford to have kids right now because we can't afford housing? Of course. I mean, affordability is a, is a huge issue for, for Canadians, and certainly here in a city like Toronto, uh, there's really no issue more pressing than that, and housing is at the top of the list. You know, as Carolyn was discussing from, from her family's experience, a lot of folks get locked into their location, and it's because of vacancy decontrol, the fact that if you move out, the next unit that you're moving into is going to be a heck of a lot more expensive. So if you are a young family, uh, or you're a person who wants to age in place and perhaps downsize in your community, your mm -hmm. options are very limited in where you can grow or downsize and move in the neighborhood. And so the end result is, you know, folks are stuck in their unit. Uh, we don't have the filtration where we have those units being becoming available for other folks who would like to move into it. And, uh, and it makes it very difficult to, to live in a city like Toronto. That is a fundamental issue. And it goes back to the supply. We do need more supply. Um, but we're not going to just build our way out of all of the issues. There has to be a deliberate intervention uh, where we are making sure that we are securing and providing affordable units for folks who are going to need them. Let me do a follow with you on this, Tony. Sure. And again, hindsight's 2020, and we're talking about events of 25 years ago or more. Right. Was it a mistake back in the 1990s to, to change policy in Ontario, whereby if a family moved out of a rental unit, the landlord could then put the rent up significantly higher and not just to the guidelines of rent review. I don't think so, and here's the reason why. When you fast forward in time, uh, someone that's lived in the unit for you know, 10, 15 years, whatever it is, uh, when they move out, of course, property taxes have gone up, utilities have gone up, uh, cost to pay staff has gone up, cost to maintain buildings, all these costs go up. How are they to be borne? Uh, if there's not an opportunity to reset the, to rent the rent to what the market will bear at that time, how is the owner of that asset supposed to be able to ma manage all those increased costs without an ability on the revenue side to, to, to address that? Is that a fair point? No. <laughs> What's unfair about it? Uh, well, I mean, what's unfair about it is that any good landlord would include the uh, cost of maintenance in the cost of rent. The main problem is that we have increasingly moved towards a market rent definition of affordability, which means that when um, uh, rents go up 20, 30 percent, that's just that's what the market can bear. So you uh, say that affordable housing is 80 percent of market uh, rent. We have to turn back to the main problem that you started this um, uh, uh, broadcast with, which is how are people going to find 
homes? How are people going to find decent, adequate homes? So if you look at the 23% of uh, Toronto renters who are in core housing need, their average income is $23,000 a year. The rent that they can afford to pay is about six fifty dollars a month. That's true if you're a single person. That's true if you're a single mom with kids. No one if can find six fifty dollars a month. No one can find six fifty dollars no, a month. It doesn't exist. 80% of renters in core housing need are um, uh, in the lowest income quintile. That mm -hmm. means uh, that they earn maybe uh, 40 or 50% of area median income. That leaves you with a maximum cost of 850. As I said earlier, in the 70s and 80s, 10% of construction was social housing. That was meeting the needs of low and moderate income people. It wasn't just public housing, it was private nonprofit, it was co-op housing, almost as much as anything in the 80s. That is what we need much more of because I'm sure Tony would agree with me that those kinds of rents will not be found in the market. So we've talked about mm. the municipal role. The municipal role is upzoning everything in Toronto. Toronto has been until recently, two thirds of the residential areas have been essentially no go mm. for right. certainly multifamily rental. Uh, you need the provincial role, which is a culture where renters are respected. There are wealthy countries in the world, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Denmark, I could go on, where the majority of people are renters, they're able to save for their retirement, they're able to sign five-year leases, um, the government takes a much more interventionist role in how much you can charge for rent. That's the provincial role, but we can't turn away from the federal role, um, the federal rule. Housing is infrastructure. If we had bridges falling apart all over Canada, no. we'd be stepping in. We need that. to step in with social housing well, as infrastructure. Okay, just for fun, just for the heck of it, I'm going to ask you a really uh, like smart-ass provocative question here, okay? What if, what if we just said, look, Toronto's one of the biggest cities in the world. It's an expensive city to live in. The market prices are what the market prices are. And, and, and if, uh, you know, we're sorry, but if you feel that you should be entitled to live in, the, in one of the biggest, most expensive pieces of real estate in the world for six fifty a month, we don't live in that world. Tough luck. You've got to live somewhere else. Can you say that? I don't think you can because Toronto's promise and aspirations are predicated on the ability that if you want to come here and contribute your time and your talent and your energy, you have an option to do that. And, and you can look at a lot of U.S. cities um, where the core is completely hollowed out. You have a concentration of poverty and you have a concentration of extreme wealth and you have nothing in the middle. That's not the type of city we want to build. That's not the type of city I want to live in. So there is a role and there is a need and Carolyn is absolutely right. Let's be clear. Housing is infrastructure. And that is a change in our mentality that we collectively, as all three levels of government and, and market and not-for-profit providers, we need to get our heads around that, that housing is in fact infrastructure. And if we don't match the order of the crisis, the housing crisis right now with, with investments of that sort of magnitude, if we don't respond to that from an infrastructure perspective, then the risk is the way we, we go the way of the US city where the core is hollowed out and it's a city that is less inclusive, less affordable, uh, and, and dies from the inside out. In which case, we need some ideas. I'd like some ideas from you on, we, we know there's a huge need, we know there is not enough supply, uh, we know that whatever supply there is is not meeting the test. Mm -hmm. What do we do? So, uh, you know, I'm not as familiar as uh, all with all of the processes back, say, in the 1990s when I was, a, a, as you said, a, a young staffer from the Harris government around how long it took to build buildings and all the different costs embedded in that. I don't, I'm not an expert at that time. Carolyn may know more on that than I do, but I can speak to what I know now, which is the time it takes to get projects approved. Councillor Bradford, we're here from constituents saying, I remember a piece a couple years ago in the media about a parking lot uh, on the Danforth. The resident group said uh, it's culturally, historically significant. We don't want it to be developed on. I mean, we have to get past these views and notions that nothing can be built anywhere for any reason at any time. Mm -hmm. We have to look at when it takes seven or eight years, and, and I, you know, I remember being at a legislative committee uh, a few years ago, and an uh, MPP asking me, or, or relaying a story in his constituency, uh, that it took 10 years to get a project through the whole process and built. And he asked me, is that is that normal? And I was relatively new in this role. I said, well, that, that seems like a lot to me, but I was told very quickly thereafter, not very unusual. So I think we have to look at the length of time it takes to get uh, uh, housing built, where it can be built, 
And I'm not an alarmist uh, sort of person, but I think this is a crisis. And in crisis times, we look at our processes and how we do things and say, we need to make some significant adjustments to how we're doing this, or it's not going to change. We're not going to meet the need for more homes that we require. So I think you know, the, the idea of uh, trying to change perceptions around renting, because I think that's also very important. Mm -hmm. you, you do look at other cities, and it's not perceived the same way as it is here. We have to really try to change views uh, that people have, but also look at all the embedded systems. Yes, growth has to pay for growth. You need sewers and roads. Uh, all of that is essential. But I think it's, it's important to look at the entire system that we have in place, the time it takes, the costs that are embedded in it. Is, are we doing it in a way that's sensible? Can things be done differently? I think there are a lot of ways that we can do things differently if we all, as Councillor Bradford and I spoke about before we were broadcasting, if we actually want more rental housing built. Hmm. And that's a fundamental question, Steve. Do we actually want it? Well, we say we do. I know we say we do, but does everyone feel that way? And well, to be fair, some, Premier right. Ford, when he was introducing Bill 23, yep. he was pretty explicitly talking about home ownership. And certainly, mm -hmm. if you look at Bill 23, it's all about sprawl. And I think we should know at this point that the costs of sprawl are huge in terms of environment, in terms of social, and in terms servicing of economics, the servicing the land. It costs so much more to service the land in a new greenfield area than it does in existing mm -hmm. areas. So I totally agree with Tony. I came in uh, here from the airport via Avenue Road, still mostly one and two story um, uh, buildings along Avenue Road. You know Road. why? What is that? No, do you know why? Because the people who live there want it that way. Yeah. Right. Do, and so is, that their, is that their right? I mean, we have uh, the right to adequate housing in Canada. Mm -hmm. Do we have the right to say no to neighboring development? It's not enshrined in the Constitution. Well, let me ask Brad Bradford then. When, when, when you've got a developer in your part of the city that wants to put up, let's say, a four or five or six story building, nothing completely outrageous, gentle density, I think is what they call it, uh, in, in an area that is pretty much all bungalowed up till now, how do you go tell the residents of that area, yeah, we really should put this up, even though I know you don't like it, but we need it? How do you have that conversation? It's a conversation about values. And, and the thing about where we are right now with housing is you can't uh, show me anybody who, who doesn't have someone impacted by the housing crisis, whether that's their kids, whether that's them themselves, whether that is their parents who want to age in place in the community, folks who want to come to Toronto uh, and live here. Everybody has a story to, to tell about how the housing crisis has impacted them. You know, my, my best friend rents in our basement. He pays a very modest amount mm -hmm. of rent. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a secondary suite and he makes a good income. You know, he makes a good income here in this city, has a good job and, uh, and yet, the options for him to live here are very, very limited. And so we start with a conversation about values. We talk about the type of city that we want to live in, one that is equitable, more inclusive, and one that can accommodate the type of growth that we want to see. And, you know, post amalgamation for the past 20 years, the planning paradigm and the prevailing thought, you know, political thought too, is keep the growth out of neighborhoods. And as it's been alluded to, you have conversations about the yellow belt. Um, the grand bargain that was really struck in our official plan back in 2003 was to say, concentrate the growth on the avenues and in the urban centers and keep it out of the neighborhoods. Well, you think about some of the most desirable and, and interesting neighborhoods here in this city. Uh, you know, the, the beaches where I'm blessed to represent, uh, you know, the annex, Kensington, they are mixed neighborhoods. And there's lots of historic rental stock, duplexes, triplexes, quads, walk-up apartments that add a lot of vibrancy and interest to those neighborhoods. It's been here for 100 years. And yet there have been specific policy decisions and political decisions that have effectively made that illegal on a go-forward well, basis. All right, then, then speak to Tony's point. Tony said, if it takes 10 years mm -hmm. from idea to getting it done, to use the Premier's verbiage these days, get it done. <laughs> You've worked in the City Hall. I mean, is that just too much time for due diligence, too much time for regulations, too much time for I don't know what goes on there that would make it take 10 years? Well, I would point out that there is a ton of approved, not yet built units in the marketplace. And so, you know, the folks at the city, uh, they, they take a lot of flack saying that they are the biggest part of the holdup. Um, there's a lot of challenges right now. Construction costs are up 30%, financing costs are up 40%. We have a, a national labor uh, and trades shortage. So all of that contributes to shovels are not getting in the ground on these approved units. 
That being said, you know, two and a half years, three years for an approval, completely uh, unreasonable. We need to get better at, at standing up a process that says housing is the outcome we want. And rather than figuring out all the different ways that we can say no, we need to turn our heads towards how can we say yes? How can we make this work? And frankly, there has not been the political courage from my colleagues for many, many years to stand up and say, no, I want you to get towards outcomes. Don't tell me all the reasons you can't do it. Show me how you can do it. So there's a fear embedded within bureaucracies, I think, across the province where, you know, for too long, political leadership has, has taken the view that we don't want to see this. They bend the knee to the local residents associations that push back on this sort of growth because we have seen an electoral system where the politician who takes a 25-story building and knocks it down to 16 stories is rewarded at the ballot box. That is wrong and that's changing right now and I wouldn't want to be one of those folks who's on the wrong side of that issue. But culture change within our organization is taking place right now. We're standing up a process so that we can get these things approved faster. Mm. Bill 109 has certainly turned the screws on us for 90 day approvals. I don't know if we're ever going to get there, but we are staffing up and changing our process uh, so that we can move housing forward faster. That's what we have to do with the city. And Carolyn? I just want to add yes. on to that, Steve, and, and say a bunch of things that I'm sure it's going to make Tony very happy. There should be as of right uh, approvals. There should be as of right zoning. What does that for, mean? That means that you don't need to sweet talk or appeal mm -hmm. to better natures mm -hmm. or spend six months arguing about every new multifamily uh, development in a way that you don't need to if you tear down a bungalow and build a monster home, by the way. Mm -hmm. So there should be as of right four stories in every part of Toronto. And there aren't right now because? And there aren't right now because of what we just heard about NIMBYism or mm. banana, uh, sure. build nothing anywhere again, uh, near anything. <laughs> um, so uh, there needs to be as of right uh, four story in all residential neighborhoods along roads like Avenue Road or, or uh, certainly Young Street. There should be uh, as of right 12 story buildings near major transit station areas. We should be looking at 20, 30 stories, particularly where there's really nice chunks of government land that would be great as social housing. You want in? Um, yeah, I'm just going to say, I mean, it, we, you know, before the pandemic, uh, uh, so many things we did or talked about that then got lost. You know, we talked about uh, in my organization uh, an idea around really leveraging unicorn sites. There are a lot of sites in the province where currently there might be a tower that stands there, maybe even two, at a, built at a time when land was abundant, planning rules were different. Uh, there's a lot of land there that could still be uh, used to build a third tower, for example, or a second tower. Mm. Uh, but the process to do that is very cumbersome. It's very, you know, as we've just talked about. So, you know, you know, we, we sort of uh, were advocating a few years ago to really sort of expedite approvals on these unicorn sites, we call them. They've already got the infrastructure there. I'm not saying go build it on your street. I'm saying build it where there already are towers, uh, assuming there aren't big towers on your street uh, where you live. Uh, so it's, it's already there. There's already an acceptance of that. Let's, you, let's leverage those, uh, those sites because, uh, you know, people ask me, well, why, why doesn't this happen more? Well, uh, building that is of apartments uh, in somewhere like Toronto, we know land is hard to come by and it's very expensive. It's a huge part of the cost of a project. So, and government, you know, accessing surplus government land is another excellent idea. But we think there are a lot of those kinds of sites that could be leveraged and shouldn't take five, six, seven years to get approved. What would it take, Brad, for governments to get back into the business of providing rental housing, for example, in the way that they did closer towards the end of World War II, as Carolyn described earlier? Well, I think you don't necessarily need to remake the mold. Carolyn provided an excellent outline. There were a lot of tax policies that actually encourage the uh, the investment from one rental project, you take that equity that mm -hmm. you've built there, roll it into the next one, and you weren't penalized for that today. Yep. There was access to low interest, long term mm -hmm. financing. Mm -hmm. You know, today uh, you're, you're lucky if you can get financing for for ten years. It used to be 20, 25 year loans. So there's a lot of risk for people when they're making investments if if the time horizon is shorter. And you know, again, back to this notion of housing as infrastructure. You know, the, the rates that you can get from CMHC, if you are able to get the money, are, are higher than what you could get from the Canada this Infrastructure Bank. Canada Mortgage and Housing you're talking that's about. That's right. And, and so that's, that's the primary place where a lot of folks are, are going to access capital, but the rates are higher. It's difficult to get it. Uh, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, if, if we took the position that housing was infrastructure and, and you could access that capital, uh, longer term, lower cost. 
So, you know, the government definitely has a role to play. I'm not saying that the government has to build the housing, although I think all options are on the table. The market is going to play a big role. We need to help facilitate that. And as, you know, as governments, there, there's access to lots of land. Uh, the city is certainly leveraging our best pieces of land located on transit to stand up housing programs. We're doing that right now. I'd invite the province and the federal government to join us in that. You know, Metrolinx has seas of parking lots around transit stations. Uh, we have hundreds of LCBO sites across this province, many here in Toronto, and we don't have a single unit of housing on top of those. It just doesn't make sense. So we all need to be rowing in the same direction, leveraging the assets, removing the barriers, and doing everything that we can to address the housing crisis. What and again, I, I completely agree with Brad on this. It's going to be a very boring panel. I know we're all agreeing. <laughs> but um, uh, if you uh, look at St. Lawrence neighborhood, What's it this? was downtown Toronto, downtown close Toronto, to close to the waterfront, big chunk of land bought by the federal government off CN uh, in the 70s. By the 80s, there were 4,000 homes there, uh, one third public, one third co-op. Let's look at co-op housing. Let's drill down into co-op housing for uh, a moment that tens of thousands of units built every year in the 1980s. 2% financing from the CMHC when the uh, uh, market rate uh, interest rate was six and a half. That's how you do it. That's how the federal government until now has not been doing it under the national housing strategy. So um, the rental construction investment that's happened since 2017, 3% of the homes created under that are affordable to people in core housing need. Only 3%, 97% aren't. Why? Because the federal government has decided that it wants to poorly subsidize private development instead of actually investing itself. It's always going to be cheaper to provide yourself rather than enter a public-private partnership that may be very, very shonky indeed. And I'm not blaming the private developers at all who've taken advantage of that scheme. It's just, it's a poorly designed scheme. So again, I do want to put some pressure on the federal government. I'm happy to go after the provincial government. I'm happy to go after the municipal government, but we mustn't forget the role of the federal government. And that shall be the last word on this discussion. Let's hope they're listening. Maybe they'll pick up some ideas here and get going with it. Tony Irwin is president and CEO of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. Brad Bradford, city councillor, Toronto Ward 19, Beaches East York, chair also of the Planning and Housing Committee at the Big Smoke, City of Toronto. And Carolyn Weitzman, housing researcher, geography professor, University of Ottawa, who came all the way from the national capital to the provincial capital to be with us tonight. And we're grateful. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Steve. Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.